So, you want to turbo your car. Classic. You want to be a boost creep. You want to make a bunch of cool noises, make a little extra horsepower, and make a bunch of dudes in a parking lot think you're cool. Trust me, I get it, but it can seem so overwhelming. There are so many parts. How do you know what to buy? How do you know if it's going to work together? Sure, bolting a turbo to your engine is sweet and all, but you got to cool the air that it spits out before it gets to your engine. That is where an intercooler comes in. But how do you know how to choose an intercooler? Are there different kinds? And what kind of considerations should you make when choosing an intercooler for your setup? Well, that's what we're gonna be working on today. We're gonna be working on the cold side of our little turbo setup. We're gonna be installing our intercooler, all our intercooler charge piping, and our blow-off valve. And along the way, we'll talk about what all of it is and how all of it works. I'm Zach, and this is Money Pit Turbo Kit Part Four. Let's get cooler. Huge thank you to Ridge Wallet for sponsoring this week's episode. If there's anything that I've learned over the past few weeks, it's that the Ridge Wallet really is the wallet of the future. You know, most of you guys are probably still using wallets that were designed in the 90s. That's like having roll down windows in your car, you purists. It's durable. It can hold up to 12 cards and even secure your cash. Not to mention, it'll save you from digital pickpockets with its RFID technology. And the best part is, you don't have to wait for the future to get one. All you gotta do is head on over to ridge.com slash donut and get you one today. And if you enter code donut, you'll get 10% off. But hurry up, because time is of the essence. Oh God, I guess that's it for me. It's time to get back to 2077. If you thought 2020 was rough, I got bad news. All right, so we already know that a turbo works by using your exhaust gas to spin the turbine, which also spins the compressor, which makes a bunch of boost, crams a bunch of air into your engine, and makes power. But the air that comes out of the turbo is gonna be hot and hot air is less dense, which means it carries less oxygen than cold air. So the idea is that we cool that air that comes out of your turbo down before it enters your engine. So we can make it cooler, make it more dense, make it carry more oxygen so we can make more power, baby. Well, that is what an intercooler does. Let's take off this front bumper and look at where this thing's gonna go. Uh, where's that 10 millimeter? Can you see it? Is it on top of the box? Yeah. Will you, will you get it? There we go. <laughs> hey! Plenty of room. So the intercooler is going to go somewhere in this vicinity and basically the idea is that one way or another we need to get the air to go from the turbo into the intercooler and then out the intercooler and into the engine. So. It's gonna be a little bit of work, but before we get into the work, let's talk about intercoolers and what the different types are and what you should be thinking about when you're looking at intercoolers. So there are a couple different types of intercoolers, uh, the most common of which being the air-to-air -air intercooler. Uh, basically, it relies on airflow to flow through it, ambient air, to cool down the charged air that's inside of it flowing through uh, these tubes. This is probably what you're most familiar with seeing on the streets and things like that. This is what's called a bar and plate style. It's just uh, in reference to the way that it's made. It's a bunch of bars and plates welded together to make uh, channels for the hot air to flow through with a lot of channels for cool air to flow through and extract the heat. And then there's also tube and fin style intercoolers. They're gonna be more common in OEM applications. Uh, they look more like a traditional radiator. There is a style of intercooler that is better than both of those at cooling uh, your charge air. And that's a water to air style intercooler. Basically, it passes your charge air through a series of cooled tubes using uh, coolant. The problem is that they are kind of complex to install, especially if you don't have a water to air cooler from the factory. So like if we wanted to put a water to air setup on this car, we'd have to install a separate pump, a separate reservoir. We'd also have to install a radiator up front. So it's kind of a complex setup. So for that reason, you don't see them all the time on the aftermarket. That's why this air to air bar and plate is probably the most common thing out there. Okay, so let's actually take a good look at the intercooler that came with our CX Racing kit. This actually looks decent. All the fins are straight. The welds look not too bad. Fin density is pretty good. Basically, the more fins per inch here, the longer air will be kind of trapped in these fins and kind of the more cooling it'll do. Usually, you'll have a little bit less fin density on the uh, charge paths in there because the more fins you have in your charge air paths, the more resistance to flow there will be. And you don't really want much resistance to flow in your intercooler. You want this thing to flow 
really well. Otherwise, you're just gonna end up stressing out your turbo. So, I mean, this thing looks pretty good. This, this size seems about appropriate for uh, the horsepower we're gonna be making. When you use an intercooler that's bigger than you need, you lose some pressure from the inlet to the outlet. That's what pressure drop is, is the difference between pressure at the inlet and the outlet. A good intercooler is gonna have a really low pressure drop of like one or one and a half PSI or, or even lower than that. A bad pressure drop is like anything north of three PSI. So a good intercooler won't lose very much pressure and you won't stress out your turbo. You won't create all that extra heat. So it is all about airflow, but how do you know how much air you're gonna be flowing and whether or not that works with the intercooler you're thinking about? There's a, at least one calculator that I know of online where you can roughly estimate horsepower to CFMs. Okay, so horsepower will estimate 260 at the crank, and that equals about 180.44 CFMs of airflow. So now that we know that, we can go to CX Racing's website and look at the info they provide us so basically what we want to do, we're going to look at this graph and on the y-axis we have CFM, cubic feet per minute of airflow, and on the x-axis we have PSI of pressure drop. 180 CFMs puts us just over three quarters of one PSI of pressure drop. Now like I said earlier, anything below one or even one and a half is pretty good. That just over three quarters of one PSI of pressure drop at our airflow, that's actually spectacular. I hope it's true. So with all that said, I think we can go ahead and try to hang the intercooler. They did include some brackets, so maybe it won't be too hard. And maybe we won't have to trim anything. I really have no idea. There are no instructions, so <laughs> we'll find out. Well, I think we're gonna have to lose AC to use this as it's supposed to be. This, uh, what is this, the receiver dryer or something? Whatever this tank is up here, uh, obstructs the intercooler from going where it should go. Uh, these brackets should meet up with these bolts up here, I think, and they can't. I mean, this is kind of the way this sort of stuff goes. You might have to trim some stuff or remove AC altogether to make room for stuff like big old intercoolers. Mm -hmm. All right, AC. Damn it, it's time to come out. Time for a time lapse. Yay, montage, baby. Okay, so we got the AC removed, uh, which actually I'm pretty excited about, freed up some room, and we've got our intercooler hung. So now that the intercooler's there, it's time to talk about intercooler piping. Uh, it's pretty simple stuff. It's usually made out of aluminum, sometimes silicone. Uh, this kit came with uh, intercooler piping that is bent and cut, supposedly to fit the Miata, so we'll see how it fits. But this is something that's also pretty easy to do with like a DIY kit that you just get a bunch of random bends and lengths of pipe, and then you can kind of cut it to fit your engine bay as you need to. But the trick is, uh, you see these raised edges here? That's a bead rolled edge, and when you're running a turbo and putting a lot of pressure in your, uh, you know, your charge pipes, that bead rolled edge is what lets the coupler and the hose clamp or T-bolt clamp really lock on there and keep from blowing off when you're making boost. So if you're cutting up your own pipes, that's kind of the trickiest part is getting the bead roller on there. You can buy a tool to make these bead rolls, but it's about like 150, 200 bucks or more. But let's talk about the size of it. You might think you should choose the biggest size you can fit because more airflow. Well, to a point that is sort of true, but if you choose an intercooler piping size that's too big, it's just really ultimately more volume that your turbo has to fill before you reach max boost. It just increases turbo lag. So it's important to not go overboard on your intercooler piping size, similarly to not going too big on your intercooler. So uh, I think these are all two and a half with a smaller pipe coming out of the turbo. That's pretty common. I believe that just kind of promotes flow towards the engine. I think that's really about all there is to talk about intercooler piping. Uh, so now, I'm going to install it. First order of business? Is? Well, what is it? Oh, <laughs> I see. Well, so actually, all right, so we ditched the air bags on this car a while ago when I did the steering wheel and also the airbag module uh, pooped the bed shortly thereafter. So uh, this airbag sensor up here 
kind of lays in the way of where the intercooler piping is gonna go. So uh, I'm just gonna get rid of it. Whatever. All right, now that's out the way. There, we're gonna have to cut a hole somewhere in this vicinity. So this stuff's probably gonna need to move. Company in the shots. Let's see. Well, uh, as uh, expected, we do have to drill a hole in like kind of this frame apron area. Uh, to do that, I'm gonna have to take the fender off. Hey, hey, remember those things? All right, so after consulting the comprehensive instructions, which consist of like a couple pictures, uh, pretty sure we know where to put the hole. So now we just gotta put it. No going back, baby. We did it. Now we just gotta paint this bare metal so it doesn't rust. Okay, now with a nice new hole, the first pipe connected to the outlet of the turbo is on and comes over out here. So now we're ready for the next piece of the puzzle, which I think is this one. So the idea when you're setting up a intercooler piping routing is just to make it as smooth as possible and as short as possible with no unnecessary bends, uh, just you know to improve flow. Well, it's a little short. Um, and I can't really move the intercooler any closer this way. This is uh, about all we've got. So you can see the pipe's hitting pretty good right there. I think we might have to do a little bashing. Should have done it. Nah. You wouldn't do it. We're gonna, we're gonna bash a little more carefully today, Eddie. All right, so after uh, referencing the instructions a few more times, I did realize this pipe was in upside down. Uh, this fitment looks ridiculous, but I guess this is how it's supposed to be. Uh, it does meet up. I mean, we're doing it. We're in business. Looks crazy, though. Uh, so we're just going to keep going and move on to the other side, get the pipe that holds the blow-off valve in, and try to get this thing connected to the throttle body. So to get this side of the intercooler piping done, the side from the intercooler to the throttle body, I needed to add a 3 8 NPT bung for our IAT sensor. So I took this home last night and uh, welded a little bung in. It's not super pretty, but it will work. So now we just gotta put this thing down in there. I do have to figure out one little hose for our idle air control valve, but shouldn't be a big deal. So let's get this on and then that's it for our intercooler piping. We've got a turbo attached to our engine. Let's see if she fits. It all links up. We are connected to our throttle body. I don't think that the routing of this intercooler piping is the best. It's a little long and a little bendy, but it will get some boost into the engine. So that's pretty exciting. Now there's one thing left that we need to install today, and that is the blow-off valve. Eddie, do it. Yeah, that one. First off, what is a blow-off valve? Well, it's basically a pressure relief valve. You know, your turbo is making a bunch of air and slinging it into your engine. But, you know, that's great when you're on the throttle. But as soon as you get off the throttle and close your throttle plate, well, there's a bunch of compressed air trying to run into your engine and it's hitting a wall. So what happens then? Basically, all that compressed air has nowhere to go and it can do significant damage to your turbo. Uh, so you gotta make sure you have a pressure relief valve. Whether that's a blow-off valve that vents to atmosphere or one that recirculates it back into the intake tract, doesn't really matter, does the same job. The atmospheric blow-off valve that we're gonna be running is the kind that makes the most noise, so that's the good stuff. But you generally need to be running some sort of a MAP sensor. If you are running a MAF, it's usually a lot more difficult to run an atmospheric blow-off valve. We have a standalone ECU with a MAP sensor, so we're gonna have no problem running an atmospheric blow-off valve, and it should sound pretty cool. Let's look at the one that came with the kit. Uh, it doesn't weigh very much. I mean, this is a really cheap knockoff blow-off valve. But the idea is that we connect a manifold vacuum uh, to this nipple here, and basically anytime you shut the throttle plate, the intake manifold goes into extreme vacuum. So as soon as this nipple sees that extreme vacuum, the valve opens and relieves all the pressure in your charge pipes. It's really simple, uh, it's pretty cool, and it sounds awesome. All right, so uh, different blow-off valves will have different flanges, which uh, have to mate up with your intercooler piping. Uh, this is a Gretti style flange, but there are a few different types. So you gotta make sure you get a blow-off valve that'll work with whatever charge piping you have, whether that's OEM or aftermarket like this. Beautiful. 
All right, now we just need to get the vacuum nipple on the blow off valve hooked up to vacuum source at the intake manifold. And I keep getting the same nipple, dude. All right, got the supplied vacuum T teed in to a vacuum line. Now we've got a vacuum reference down to our blow off valve. So with that, our cold side is pretty much done. The intercooler's in, all our piping is in place. We've got our holes cut, it's all installed, and we've got a blow off valve on. There is legitimately a turbo connected to this engine now, and that's pretty exciting. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned a thing or two. Come back next week when we're gonna be doing fueling on the Miata so we can get that much closer to actually ripping this thing on the streets. Thank you so much for watching. Follow me on Instagram at Zach Job and follow Donut at Donut Media and I'll see you guys next week for part five. Goodbye.